evening, everyone. Welcome to this masterclass where we will be talking about 10 advancements in climate science. Some housekeeping matters. This session will be recorded, which you can later access in our YouTube channel. Please do share this with anybody who you think would be interested. Uh, Dr. Prakash has made this a very interactive session, so please feel free to unmute yourself uh, either during the session or uh, post his presentation to ask him questions. You can either uh, you can also uh, post your questions in the chat box, which I can read to him. Um, we hope that this will be an interactive session for everybody and we can learn from each other. A quick introduction of our esteemed speaker today, Dr. Anjal Prakash. Dr. Prakash is the Research Director at Bharti Institute of Public Policy, Indian School of Business. He was the coordinating lead author of IPCC's special report on oceans and chirosphere in a changing, clim in a changing climate. In the IPCC's sixth assessment report, he contributed as lead author in the chapter on cities and mountains. He has also coordinated the cross-chapter paper on gender for the report. Dr. Prakash, thank you for taking out your valuable time today to join us. Over to you. Thank you so much, Davishna. And uh, so good to hear uh, from, uh, you know, to see all the people here out. Uh, and I'm looking forward to... Um, to the interactive session. Uh, the way I've organized this session is uh, that there are some quizzes uh, and I will uh, see if, uh, uh, if uh, uh, you know, um, uh, so we'll roll out the quiz and then we will get to the answers of the quiz uh, as we go along. So uh, next uh, 30 minutes we'll have, so this presentation is going to be in two parts. The first part is about the science of climate change. Uh, the, uh, you know, I've written is climate changing because there are so many people uh, who, think that climate is changing, but don't know how is it changing. So I'm going to take them through uh, certain uh, quizzes, certain questions uh, through which we'll try to understand how is it changing. And second part is, um, um, you know, of this uh, presentation is about 10 advancement in climate science, which I'll tell you um, as, as we go, go along. So next 45 minutes, and then uh, this will be followed by what we call a question answer session. And I'll be very happy to answer. And I understand that most of you are younger uh, lots and then I um, I mean I feel much younger when I talk to younger people so um, I look forward to your questions critical assessment and uh, as well as uh, um, you know seeing looking forward to interacting with you and not only in one and a half hours but otherwise as well so you can always be in touch with me so let me just take it forward um, before uh, I go forward let me just uh, uh, if you can from your smartphone if you can scan the uh, barcode on the screen or uh, go to slido.com and give this number 787-884 um, and log in here and tell me which city have you logged in from. I see only one person logging in, but um, I request all of you to, okay, so one person from Delhi. This is word cloud, so more and more people from a city, the city will get bigger and bigger. So New Delhi, Delhi, Bangalore, Bangalore, Gurgaon. Okay, a lot of people are from Bhopal. Nice. Mumbai, Jabalpur, Ranchi. Very good. Pune, Hyderabad. So I'm from Hyderabad and I'm logging in from Hyderabad. Chhattisgarh. Which city in Chhattisgarh? Okay, how many 42 participants are there? I expect. So once I reach there, I will uh, go next. Okay, so now 21 people have logged in. Bokaro Street City, Maharashtra. Which city in Maharashtra? Jabalpur, Gurgaon, Rachi, Uttarakhand, Bangalore, Raipur. A lot of people from Raipur. Uh, Mumbai, Delhi is becoming bigger. New Delhi and Delhi together. Indore, beautiful city, very clean city. Okay, Jakarta, wow, that's very nice. Ahmedabad. So, Davishna, you have a larger footprint in uh, Bhopal, Raipur, Mumbai, Delhi, and a lot of other uh, cities that we have. Kashipur, beautiful. Yeah. Okay, Raipur, Indore. Okay. 
I'll go next. Afghanistan. Wow. Who is from Afghanistan? Can you just uh, unmute yourself and introduce and tell me who, where are you, which city in Afghanistan are you from? Uh, hello, sir. Uh, uh, this is Mushtaba Rafi from uh, Kabul, Afghanistan, uh, assistant professor from uh, uh, Parwan University and uh, studied uh, geography in Savitra Bay, Fuli Pune University. So nice to hear from you, Mujdaba. Very nice. And I've been to Afghanistan, beautiful country and beautiful place. Uh, I look forward to interacting with you further. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Fine. Let me just go. Okay. Mumbai is getting bigger and bigger, bigger than Delhi. Because Delhi is now divided into New Delhi and Delhi. So that's one. But then, okay. Let me just quickly go next. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So, um, I, this is where I want to ask you, what are the environmental challenges faced by the world today? And give me one uh, utmost challenge that you think is uh, the world is facing. Okay. Same uh, procedure, go to, um, okay, climate change. Um, okay. So two people have logged in. Let's see. Global warming. Food security. Scarcity. Food scarcity. Heavy rain, uneven rainfalls, waste disposal, very good point. Air pollution, stream rainfall, pollution. Air pollution is becoming bigger, rise in temperature, global warming together, heat waves, impact of heat wave, <clears throat> increase in carbon footprints, okay. <clears throat> Climate crisis, very good. As we are speaking, can um, somebody who has written about cl climate crisis as a point, can you unmute yourself and tell me what is this? Can you elaborate what do you mean by climate crisis? Whoever has put in this num this challenge? Or anybody else who wants to speak, can you tell me what is climate crisis for you? as we are populating this. Okay. 22 people, I need some more people to log in uh, and uh, put in your point. What are the environmental challenges faced by the world today? Let me just uh, tell you what are the ones uh, which the house has uh, uh, you know, voted a lot more is uh, climate change, global warming, biodiversity loss, uh, air pollution, uh, then loss of biodiversity, climate crisis, frequent climate shocks. In Afghanistan, flood, definitely Mujtaba. Uh, floods are becoming very, very common nowadays and especially also because of the glacier meltdown. Uh, so all these things are interrelated. Uh, tree cover loss for deforestation, Food habits uh, is not an environmental challenge, but definitely I think food uh, insecurity or maybe the decline in food production could be one. Um, uh, the heat waves. So yeah, these are the uh, major ones I could see, uh, but I see very prominent climate change uh, is becoming a big issues and all of you are here to discuss about that. So I'm very happy. Uh, okay, let me just tell you five uh, challenges that, yes, go ahead, Mujiba. Had somebody want to say something? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, go ahead, Kajal. Uh, am I audible? Yes, totally. So, sir, if we talk about climate crisis, I think it's a term used to describe in the current state of our global climate. Mm -hmm. The scenario that we are getting right now, whether it's a, whether it's a change, whether it's a climate, climate change itself, and the, the disaster that we are getting right now. So, in a part of climate, earlier it was, we can say that earlier it was climate change, and now we can shift the a particular generation climate crisis, in my opinion. Yeah, very good point, Kajal. Uh, where are you from? Yeah. Which uh, which uh, city are you? Have you logged in from, Burman? Uh, I I belong to this Pune city right now. I'm okay. doing my PhD at uh, SPPU. 
Wonderful. Yeah. So I, I, I do get your point that climate change definitely is a phenomena, but uh, the crisis is what is striking us. And I, um, as we are speaking today, just yesterday, the uh, IPCC synthesis report has been out. Now, this is the synthesis report of the six assessment cycle. There were three special reports and um, uh, uh, which and which was focused on 1.5 degree warming land and uh, and a stock report, which is special report on oceans and cryosphere, where I was part of. And uh, then um, we have uh, three uh, uh, big report, the Climate Science Working Group 1, 2, and 3 report. Uh, so this synthesis report actually consolidated all the findings of the uh, reports, which started from 2014 to 2022. So that means almost seven to eight years of uh, climate science has been coming in a nutshell. It was released yesterday. And some of these issues that uh, Kajal, you talked about of climate crisis is one of the major region, major uh, uh, part of the report saying that we are at least at a juncture uh, of the history where we uh, you know uh, it's uh, if we don't take action now we will actually lead ourselves into a crisis situation which will be very difficult to come back to in a sense you can't fix it if you're so the window of opportunities for us is waiting shorter and shorter is about 15 to 20 years is what uh, what we are trying to expect it from the science that out there but anyway we'll we'll talk about it slightly later let me just tell you what are the five environment climate challenges that uh you know according to me uh the first and foremost is definitely about the changing climates which all of you have have, uh, have um, uh, voted for or have written about water shortage water demand and supply gaps are increasing there's rising temperature. I think most of you covered it. The Earth temperature is increasing at an unprecedented state. Uh, the recent pledge report of IPCC says that in, it has never happened in the uh, uh, in the two thousand years of the recorded history of uh, uh, you know world, right? Also, this this part uh, increases urbanization. The urbanizations in the our part of the world are actually um, unplanned, uh, and that means it is leading. And some of you have talked about the waste uh, collection part of it, and that's important because as we are urbanizing more and more, we have not even in India we have no there's no one city which fully uh, takes care of its waste, and that means as we are urbanizing, as we are developing so-called we're also generating a lot of waste which is polluting uh, air pollution uh, water pollution all other pollutions are acting so that is what then we also have what we call the climate induced risk and hazard because cities also some of the coastal cities for example um, are are exposing themselves to uh, increased cyclones and that is leading to a lot of hazards which may come sea level rises and other ones so there are many many uh, things industrial pollution as some of you have already talked about effluents and air pollution due to rising economy uh, the lack of enforcement and regulations is also there so they are not that the real the uh, you know, policies are not there, but the enforcement agencies are not working to the maximum that you should have. So that's the part of, okay. Which are the sectors which are affected by this? I'll not dwell into much, but very quickly, health is one. Um, in economic growth, as uh, you see that, uh, you know, when more and more uh, climate change uh, led events are striking, uh, there'll be, you know, if the city goes to a standstill for a for a big flood that comes, uh, it impinges economic growth. There are other ways, now we're talking about uh, the early showers that has come, the, you know, the early uh, so the rise in temperature in Northwest India has actually led to a lot of wheat production uh, uh, getting uh, skewed. Uh, there were 20 to 30 percent of wheat uh, production will be uh, what we expected that it will be lesser than um, what we ex uh, you know what the production will be at the same time uh, now we just had a, a, a kind of very heavy rains in in some part of the of the of india and that means that uh, this weather is becoming very very unpredictable and that is leading to food insecurity uh, food security so it's striking the food security sector water is another sector which is hugely impacted by climate change floods drought all these things are glacial decline all these things are directly impacting uh what we call the water sector so these are key sectors which are uh, affected by climate change let me go um and check with you um what do you think uh, the overwhelming majority of scientists agree that climate change is real and caused by humans. Is it true or false? What do you think? Just vote. Eight people have logged in. I want uh, everyone to log in. Uh, then I'll tell you the result. Yeah. 
let me pick up some people. Um, Shinan, what do you think? True or false? Salil, what do you think? True or false? Kaushik, Nishtha. Hopefully true. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Manoj? I feel it is true, sir. True? Okay. Let's see. 22 people have logged, have uh, voted. Let me just give you the result, okay? So definitely it's true, 100% of you are saying. Uh, so, um, but there's a small portion. So what happens is that I'll, there's a small caveat that definitely the uh, the way in which your climate has changed over the last 2000 years uh, is definitely a human uh, induced climate change. And uh, so that means that we all agree that it's a real and caused by us humans, but there is a small portion of climate change is also is, a, is part of a change phenomena. So this happens on its own, the kind of, um, you know, uh, changes in species, human interactions with our otherwise also. So uh, not everything what is happening is climate change. Uh, this small proportion of it um, is uh, also a natural phenomena of change which happens. So <clears throat> if you would have opted for false and if you would have given me the right answer this could have also been a right answer okay so i just wanted you to know about it okay this is uh interesting and i'm sure all of you will get it right please don't uh um, google it and just directly answer it which of the following is not a greenhouse gas carbon dioxide water vapor nitrogen and methane which is not a greenhouse gas Katarupa, can I ask you what do you, what is your uh, answer? Shatarupa. Okay, she's not responding. Bharti Chhatre. Yes, Shri. Nitrous oxide is a gas and nitrogen is not a greenhouse gas. Nitrogen is part of our environment. So that's my answer. Okay, let's see. Okay, 22 people have logged in. Let me just go and tell you. So, yes, you were right. Nitrogen is not a greenhouse gas. Can you tell me why it is not a greenhouse gas? No, it's it's like a very useful gas, right? It's there in our environment all the time. So, I think it's not a, like a greenhouse gas. No, that's not the correct answer. <laughs> 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 you can't okay so water vapor is one i know water vapor and carbon dioxide and methane are there so that's also another way of answering it okay no so fine i'll just tell you so um uh, so those who have and this happens every time because we, a lot of people think that water vapor is uh, uh, not a greenhouse gas here or you know um, nitrogen is very few people actually so i'm happy that 35 percent of this house is correct uh, that nitrogen is the is not a greenhouse gas um, so basically what has happened is that the heat trapping greenhouse gas absorbs and emits radiation within the thermal infra infrared range and water vapor, carbon dioxide and methane are Earth's most abundant greenhouse gas. Okay, And I'll tell you why because there's another slide which tell you why water vapor is also a greenhouse gas. Nitrogen which makes about 80% of Earth's atmosphere is not a greenhouse gas because of the, uh, the molecule structure which contains two atoms of same element, so nitrogen which is unaffected by infrared, right? So when you have these two um, uh, atoms, which is our same element, which is which is actually not a greenhouse gas because it will be unaffected by the infrared gas, right? But there are in climate, uh, uh, you know, science, there are two parts. There's this positive climate feedback and the negative climate feedback. So if you see, uh, for example, there's an increased carbon dioxide concentration, then global air temperature will increase. When it increases, it increases the water vapor in the atmosphere. Because the water vapor will increase, uh, there's an increased greenhouse, greenhouse warming from the water vapor. And then it leads to uh, what we call global uh, air, air temperature again rising. So water vapor actually doesn't cause 
global warming instead it's a consequence of the global warming right so it then absorbs the heat radiated from the earth preventing it from escaping uh, to uh, space to the space and this further warms the atmosphere resulting in the more water vapor in the atmosphere so remember when they say water vapor it's a positive climate feedback and that's still a greenhouse gas okay Okay, let me just go. This is no brainer, but I'll just try and see if, how how much of this house can. Which is the increase? What is the increase in average global temperature on Earth since 1870 till date? Okay, how much has the Earth warmed up? Is it 0.82 degree? Is it 1.16 degree? Is it 1.56 degree? Is it 2.21 degree? Since 1870, 1870 is a mark because that is the time when the uh, it's, uh, industrial revolution started and most of our uh, today's climate change is, is the cause of the, uh, uh, the initial uh, stages of industrial revolution, which has contributed to uh, carbon dioxide emission and that led to what we call the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, right? So, uh, so that's why 2070, uh, 18, 1870 is marked. But let's hear, let's see how much, uh, how many of you get this right? Kemangi, can you tell me what is your answer? Or Yashashri or Shubham, anyone? I'll reach it 22 and then I'll give you my answer. Dr. Prakash, there are also some people who are answering on the chat box. Okay. Yeah. So oh, I am not able to see that. Okay. Satavuka said 1.16 and Himangi said 1.16. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So that's good. Uh, okay. So Satarupa, you're right. It is 1.16 degree. That's fifty percent of this house is right. Okay, some of you think it is one point five six five six degree. Um, it is not because see the recent climate uh, IPCC report is telling that uh, it, earlier when we you know uh, the, uh, the when the Paris Agreement was there, we uh, it was discussed that okay it will be one point five degree uh, warming should be there till the end of century. That means we should uh, gather together and take measures so that we don't increase Earth's temperature to one point five degree. But um, uh, now, because we did not cooperate, we didn't come together. Now, the reports are telling us that it, we will reach 1.5 degree by uh, middle of the century itself as the way we are non-cooperating. That's number one. And even 2 degrees centigrade, the synthesis report is telling us that the 2 degrees centigrade uh, also warming is we are going to breach it. That means the, uh, you know, it's going to go beyond 2 degree warming. Now, why is this important? I'll tell you. I have a short video, which I will tell you why is warming not good for us, right? Okay. So, 2.21 um, degree, no, no, no. We have, we, we, we still have 50, 60 years, 70 years to go to reach that 2.2. Crew 2.2 is catastrophic, right? So, this is, um, if we reach that level of forming, that means we are going to be, it's very, very difficult for us to survive as humans. It's, it's the, that warming is cause, going to cause huge impact on lives and livelihood of the people. Okay. Let me just show you how have we formed up from 1880 onwards. This is, uh, and you can just see this how uh, for each month, how has the warming. So this is minus one degree. And then in between you have zero degree and you have plus one degree and you see how it has, it has happened. So till 1950, we're still zero degree. We started getting more and more. Uh, the, the started getting more warmed up. So last 30, 40 years has been unprecedented rate of warming. It's an incremental warming as we call it. Now, some of you must have been born in these years, now 87 and 1991. And you see the warming part of it, right? Yeah, 
So this is the level of warming, and we already reached. If you see, we already reached a uh, uh, 1.16 degree. In fact, it's 1.2 degree now, as we are talking. Uh, that's the level of warming that we have already reached. Now, if you see this uh, uh, screen or this uh, thing, also you will see there's a there's a there's a graph which is going down. And please focus on that as well as look at your uh, how warming and uh, uh, the world map looks like. This graph has been plotted in the world data is actually the average temperature. This is the 2000 years of recorded history that we have in terms of the world temperature. As you could see, the color uh, will start to change, and the, as more and more warming happens, and you will find it in the in the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the temperature code here on this side. Yeah, so this is the uh, graph, and if you see the kind of warming that we already have, uh, and you, if you focus on the last part of the graph as the graph is going up, there's a small dip here, and then there's uh, there's a uh, you know rise there. Can anybody tell me what is exactly happened? Why is this dip here? It's due to COVID. Yes, exactly, Ch Charvi, Charvi, right? Charvi. Charvi. Yes, Charvi. Charvi. Yes, so it is uh, because COVID, when everything was had gone to standstill, we were actually going down in terms of the global warming. So we were emitting less and less because this life was a standstill. So that shows that it's possible for us to check the warming if we do human action, uh, not the COVID-like situation, but actually voluntary, we can do a lot of things that can uh, that can prevent us uh, contributing to global warming, and that's what this whole thing is all about. Okay, and this is the last slide, and we'll go into the next uh, segment. Okay, I'll go next. Um, so the next question is, as the global temperature rises, what happens? Is the average precip precipitation, that means rainfall increases, average rainfall decreases, or it becomes unchanged? What do you think? And kindly do it faster because uh, time is getting shorter. So please do it faster. We have to cover a lot more in the next 15 minutes. As the global temperature rises, as we are warming and warming, the world is warming, uh, what happens is the average rainfall increases, the average rainfall decreases, or it becomes unchanged. What do you think? Okay, I'm going to show you the result. In the in the in the face-to-face -face class, there's a lot of interaction on this, but I will uh, you know, just in the interest of time, I'll just move forward. Okay, so average precipitation increases, 65% of you are right. 
uh, yes, what it happens, what happens is that when the warming happens, it activates the water cycle and higher temperature gives rise to more active water cycle, right? And which means faster and greater evaporation. And once you have faster and greater evaporation, the precipitation in more extreme weather events. But the, the thing what it does is that it makes the weather unpredictable. So you would just see a couple of days before there was a heavy rains in Hyderabad, in Northwest India, a lot of other places, which is not, this was a no, there was no time that this, this, this uh, time of the year it would have been raining, but it rains like anything, right? And it was heavy precipitation. This is the kind of thing that we'll be expecting. The weather becomes unpredictable. And that means some of the sectors, like especially for agriculture, for example, will be very, very disadvantaged advantage because they don't know what to do, you know. Anyway, uh, let me just go very quickly and see with, where are some of the, okay, what do you think that uh, some of the strongest and earliest impacts of global warming occurs? How, where does it occur? In the tropics, in the northern latitudes, or it is it is same across the planet? What do you think? Where have some of the strongest and earlier impacts of the global warming occurs in the tropic tropics in northern latitude or it's it becomes equally distributed across the planet? What do you think? Who is most affected? Which top region is most affected? Northern latitude, Ajit Singh. Okay. Okay, so I'm not going to wait further because I have to uh, you know, go slightly faster. So uh, Ajit and uh, the other people who have said this is actually true. It's northern latitude because they are very, very sensitive. So those people who have opted for tropics, not the uh, tropics are still can resist a lot of changes, but northern latitude, which is very sensitive um, uh, to the uh, to warming. Uh, some of the fastest warming regions in the planet includes actually Alaska, Greenland, and Siberia. These are Arctic environment, highly sensitive to even small temperature rise, which can melt sea ice ice sheets and permafrost and leads to change in the earth reflectance, right? So that's why, and they are very, very important because they regulate climate uh, uh, for, for the entire world. So these are very important ecosystem that we must preserve, right? Where are these places? Though you have this Antarctica here and you have this Arctic, uh, Arctic uh, in the North America and this side, entire side is Arctic oceans, right? So this is where it is. You just, one more thing is about Antarctica and then Arctic oceans. And this is the Northern Pole, the Southern, uh, Southern Pole. These are two very, 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 uh, uh, you know, sensitive environment, but they also regulate the environment. That's why we need them to be there. There's this, so these are called North Pole and the South Pole. There's a third pole, uh, which is not very far from where we are at this moment. Can anybody tell me what is the third pole? Anyone? Himalayas. Himalayas, yeah. Who said this? Can you just name yourself? Nishtha. Yeah, Nishtha. Yeah, very good, Nishtha. Yes. So Himalayas is called the third pole because the largest concentration of ice outside the polar region, right? And it is um, uh, it's something which is uh, which is a shared resource between eight countries, including uh, uh, our professor from Afghanistan, starting from Afghanistan, going all the way to Myanmar. And these are uh, important ranges that we must protect. And in fact, the report that I was part of, this special report on ocean and biosphere, uh, <clears throat> predicted that two thirds of the glaciers actually will be declined by the end of the century. As I said, this the when when the glaciers decline, it has huge impact on the water regimes, and that's where uh, the major problems in the water sectors will also be occurring. Okay, let me just go and check it out. Uh, this one is no brainer, but I'm sure uh, if we'll see what was agreed during Paris Agreement that came out of COP21 uh, in Paris in 2015. Is it to protect biodiversity? Is it to keep global temperature below 2 degree and pursue the path of limiting warm, warming to about 1.5 degree? Is it sea level rise uh, to limit sea level rise or to pursue the goal of 100% clean and renewable energy? What do you think? Temperature below 2 degrees Celsius and pursue to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Who said this? Can you, Radha? Thank you, Radha. Radha. Okay. Yes, thank you, Radha. Okay, so yes, Radha is right, and a lot of other you are all, most of you are right here. So that's very good. Let me go. But we're slowly getting into energy sectors now. 
which of these countries emit most of carbon dioxide? What do you think? <coughs> is it USA? Is it China? Don't say, just vote first. Is it China? Is it India? Is it Russia? Okay, Prashant is saying USA. I'll give two more minutes and then I will move quickly. Otherwise, I'm going to go overboard with time. Okay, let's see what the house thinks. Okay, 63% of you think it's USA, but it's actually not USA, it's China, okay, at this moment, okay? And I'll tell you the thing. So what 28% of global carbon dioxide emission happens from China, and uh, United States about 15%, okay? India is 7%, and Russian Federation is 5%, and rest is divided in between the rest of the world. <coughs> okay, so it's, it's not uh, USA, US is second, China is the first one, India is third. Okay, let me just tell you, which of these countries have highest per capita carbon dioxide emission? Per capita. Okay, is it China, India, USA or Russia? USA, USA, Prashant is saying USA, Man, uh, Mujtaba is saying USA. Okay. Mustafa, you were right earlier. Yeah, He's saying you were saying. Uh, yes. And you're right this time as well. Let me just open this, just give the results. So USA definitely is the highest per capita CO2 emission. And India is actually lowest. China is, I'll just give you the, the, the figures. So China is about 7.38. USA is about 15.52. India is 1.91. Afghanistan is not even there, you know, minuscule. They have not contributed to the climate change, you know, but they're at the receiving. Yes, sir, Afghanistan doesn't have any. Yeah, it may be climate negative also, you know. Yeah, uh, Russia is 11.44 percent. Sub-Saharan Africa is about 0.7 percent. So uh, you look at the per capita emission. India is one of the lowest. Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you know about, about uh, the conglomerate countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. They are some of the least uh, uh, contributor to the present climate change. I think because CO2 emission per capita is still very very low. China is is more. Uh, in the uh, US is the highest in that sense. Okay. Uh, okay, let me just uh, come and ask you here, globally, which of the following economic sectors emits the largest percent of greenhouse gas? Is it transportation? Is it building? Is it energy? Or is it agriculture? What do you think? Quickly. Energy. Ha, Ajit, just vote ki jay pehle. <laughs> Dekhte. So per capita is, uh, is uh, you know, whatever the total emission is there and that divided by the country uh, population, right? So if India is, uh, you know, uh, emitting 100 tons divided by what a billion people, that's the per capita, right? And definitely it is within the year that we take it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, in the interest of time, I'm just going to show uh, the result. Energy, 50% of this house is right, energy. And, uh, and actually, if I show you, it's energy, which is about 73.2% of total greenhouse gas emission that happens in energy sector. But if you see further, you energy use in, uh, say, uh, in buildings, in transport, and energy use in industry. These are all part of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And that's why it's very important. So if you have to work and focus on reducing climate uh, impact, uh, climate change impact, you have to work a lot on the energy sector that still uh, is, is a major major uh, sources of uh, greenhouse gas emissions okay 
Okay, I'm going to just uh, leave this and get, go into the what we call the uh, new advancement in climate science. I'm going to quickly tell you what are the new advancements. So the first is, you know, the, so far we have been saying that then we have to adapt to the changes of climate. But now this report is telling us that in only adaptation will not work. We have to also mitigate. That means you have to, uh, you know, take long term actions. For example, energy, you have to reduce, you have to become low carbon economy. A lot of other things are there. So mitigation is the key adaptation is uh, is definitely there you can adapt but there are some time you actually go beyond adaptation because you know if you are say staying in a in an area which is frequently uh, infested by flood and you may have to move out you can't adapt you have to there's a limit to which adaptation can happen so that's number one uh, which is uh, questioning the end myth of endless adaptation we can't endlessly adapt that means we have to mitigate and that means the countries which are producing most of the carbon dioxide must take action to reduce the emission. That's the whole point number one. Okay, second is, um, you know, when we say that uh, uh, vulnerability hotspot cluster uh, in the region of risk, uh, there are more and more people are becoming vulnerable. About 1.6 billion people live in what we call vulnerability hotspots, which is going to be doubled by 2050. So second message is actually about uh, vulnerability. And if you see this map here, you'll find that the darker color are, uh, are where people are more concentration and more, uh, you know, uh, where, where human vulnerability is very, very high. So this part of Africa, you look at India, you look at part of Afghanistan and Bangladesh, this entire South Asia region that has a mix uh, of vulnerable conditions and people living in vulnerable environment. And that's where we human capacity to cope and uh, uh, you know, resist from the changes of climate change is very, very limited. Prashant, I'll take up the question. Just give us some time. I'm just finishing in five minutes and I'll take up the question. The third, uh, then we, we uh, talk about what we call new threats on the horizon from climate. This is the climate and health, health interaction. So far, the uh, you know there has been less studies on looking at how climate change is impacted by health and vice versa. Uh, now the literature is coming in health uh, you know part and is showing that because of the global temperature rise and other places, new diseases are coming and that is also having impact. So this risk is emerging, new risks are emerging, it's becoming widespread. And that's where the problems also are lying. So health and climate change interaction are also becoming much more sharper. Then this part is what we call the mobility part. So people are migrating, right? Wherever they are in the risk situation, they are migrating worldwide. Their mobility is very, very much. And some of these regions are highly infested by people who come from climatically risk area. And that is migration is an adaptation option. They, they migrate, but it's a forced adaptation option. They leave their families, their people and all that. And the male hair, most of the time, they die, migrate to a region and, and then they start sending the money back. This is a, becoming a messy situation, especially in terms of forced migration, which we see. Then the other question is that human security requires climate change. If you really want to work on climate security, you need to work on what we call the human security aspects of it. That's the fifth one. Okay. Sixth is land use, uh, you know, as a sustainable land use essential to meeting carbon climate targets. Now, there was a report on land, a special report on land, which actually focused on seeing that the land also is getting degraded. So we are overcropping things. We are putting uh, a lot of pressure on the land because the product Activity of the land has declined and that is where uh, we need to use what we call sustainable land use practices and that's the sixth point. The seventh point is about the finance, uh, the climate finance, especially the private sector finance, um, um, you know, for example, the um, insurance and all has uh, we have seen that it doesn't work actually speaking so we need to really uh, walk uh, towards the you know solution where uh, where we uh, are supporting these pe these people who are affected by climate change and the the private finance has not worked and that's the global data is showing us the eighth is loss and damage. Uh, I think this part, uh, this uh, COP27 has already, uh, uh, you know, started to talk about uh, loss and damage as a fund. Uh, this is a, a, an urgent imperative for the for the planetary imperative. We must need this because people who are affected by climate change 
are the one who are least contributed to the climate. So there's an equity principle, which is important for us to adhere to. That's number eight. Number nine is about inclusive decision making for climate resilient development. So climate change is a global phenomena, but has a very localized impact. That means the local people who are affected by climate change must be part of the decision making, must be part of the process that affects their life and the decision that affects their lives. That policy and practices must be taken into account with the people who are these who are most affected by this one. Most of the time, it is not. The last point is that we have to break down what we call the structural barriers and unsustainable lock-ins. We need to take drastic action. The transformative action is there. And that's what this uh, synthesis report is also telling us that the last chance for the humanities to uh, take action. If you don't take it now, the next IPCC report is going to come only about 2030. By the time things have drastically changed. And that means that we don't have an option. The window of opportunity is closing slowly, slowly. And that means we need to act now. And that is how I would end here. But I'll be very happy to take your questions and uh, and uh, answer it. When you're asking question, please put on your video so that I can see who you are and introduce yourself and tell me what the question is all about. Over to you, uh, Davisha. Davishna, you can navigate this for me. Absolutely. Sure, Dr. Prakash. Thank you so much for that interactive session. I see Shavi has a question. Yeah. Uh, sorry, one second. I hope you can see me. Uh, yes, Shavi. Go ahead. Please introduce yeah. yourself. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Shavi. I am a sustainability management professional. So I'm currently working at KPMG. Uh, and uh, actually, so I worked with the in the transport industry before this automotive, and I was working on a climate risks project. And I was trying to uh, integrate climate risks in their upstream supply chain. Nice. And uh, the sort of answers I was getting was that uh, I hope Hindi is fine. Uh, yes. You know, these are the answers I was getting. Uh, like when I told, ki, okay, you won't have water in this particular area. Uh, and, uh, you know, because of uh, rising temperature, it will be difficult for people to work in your factory. And the answers I was getting at that too from the sustainability manager was that, <laughs> that it's okay, our factory will still work. We don't need people for our factory. It's all automated. So, I mean, when uh, a sustainability professional is getting answers like that, how do we tackle these kind of questions in the private? Uh, uh, what would you suggest how to tackle these kind of questions around and work around it? Yeah, Charvi. So this is more of a comment than a question, but I will definitely like to tell you that uh, yeah. one thing that, you know, I mean, one couple of things which has happened recently, which is a policy change, especially the ESG uh, part of it, right? So now the listed companies have to uh, declare and also show us um, how how are they faring on the ESG front. In fact, I was just came back from Delhi. There was a launch of uh, India ESG network, which is actually trying to portray uh, and because there's lack of professionals to even uh, cater to the need and there's a job market out there people who the sustainability uh, officers managers that he was talking about uh, so i think more and more number of people with climate sensitive understanding like you uh, will be joining the sector with that so the you know so our uh, um, yeah, what I would say, the numbers will increase. So once we numbers increase, we will make the debt. That's number one. Second is also the government policies has made it mandatory for these companies to report on it. And wherever um, they are not doing it, there's compliance part of it, which they are also not very, uh, you know, uh, they have to be very, very careful of what they report. Third is also about... Um, I think they I have always said that the, the sustainability part has to be uh, in the decision making format, right? So that means the sustainability manager should also be sitting on the board. So it has to come from the top down. Otherwise, companies will not change. And I totally understand where you come from, uh, because these are things which has been earlier, just a box ticking exercise that, okay, fine, we'll do that. Who's going to check it? But now there because stringent actions and the reliance, uh, uh, in the and the uh, policies of the government, the regulations are there. It's becoming more difficult for them to dodge it. So that's what I would say at this moment. But more and more awareness uh, will also be needed. So I would say that you know we need to also spread awareness for these people, bring them to uh, decision uh, discussion forums, talk to them about it. If if fifty percent of they change, also that will help a lot. Yeah. 
absolutely i think academics like you uh, have to interact with people like with these kind of people so that there's more absolutely i am any time very happy to direct in fact uh, when davishna and other people have asked and they said younger crowd i said i love the people you know to interact with young people because i think that's where the change is lighted i think our generation has failed to protect the environment it's your generation the generation next is something will be taking it forward thank you so, thank much. You so much thank you There was a question from uh, Prashant uh, and then Kajal on the chat box. Um, Prashant, I said one of the keys. Okay, go ahead, Prashant. Uh, I'm sorry, my camera looks not working. Uh, so my question is regarding the vulnerability score that you gave. Uh, uh, the region that you pointed out in the map earlier was uh, precisely, I think, somewhere around the Tibet region. Or the, which is affecting North India. So uh, in the last one year, we've seen the Tapovan uh, glacier breaking and all those things. How do you think the Himalayan vulnerability and the Tibet region militarization would impact uh, the climate uh, thing? Uh, and also our development on the Northern India, especially the sensitive ecological belt of Uttarakhand and uh, and that thing which is ecologically very sensitive how do you think we can manage yeah, that i yeah thanks prashan my uh, you know uh, my stand is very clear these are very very sensitive fragile ecosystem you have to think twice thrice and maybe five times before you do any planning uh, to you know to to amend the environmental condition that we have and you are totally right in saying that this region has been Himalayan region is one of the most sensitive region, um, and um, and that means that um, you know whatever we are doing in this Himalayan, especially the hydropower projects, um, I am totally against uh, hydropower projects uh, coming up in very eco, eco sensitive zones uh, because they create havoc. And I've done it uh, studies in both eastern and western Himalayan regions to see that this is something. And you you have seen Joshimat uh, case, which is a case in point when you know the entire city is actually sinking. So so this is no brainer. Uh, but there's a huge rent seeking. See, these are Himalayan states. We have no other, you know, apart from small tourism time that happens two, three months at the time, they don't have much uh, resources. And in fact, these big projects bring in a lot of money, which feeds into the political system. And that's why these, uh, you know, a, be it BJP, be it uh, Congress, any other government, government changes, but the projects don't, the, you know, the projects remain the same. And that's where the problem lies. I think uh, more and more awareness and question asking you know, questions like this is something that we need to definitely uh, do. That's right. Totally for you on these aspects. I'm totally against the uh, uh, unrampant uh, development happening in the in the system. But at the same time, I also want to tell you that the basic systems, these are also one of the thickly populated mountain systems of the world. Himalayan region is one of the most uh, you know densely populated if you compare with other mountain systems of the world and that means that we need to bring uh, basic uh, uh, you know uh, roads uh, uh, health facilities education facilities and i'm not against development of those areas but that has to be environmentally benign that means you need to talk to the people for example if there's a water stream the dhara comes these are uh, you know the uh, uh, the streams which are lifeline for the people and what does the road construction they block the entire uh, dhara system right or they are not able to understand because the construction the engineers come from outside mostly they don't understand the local ecologies than the local people and that's why there's a mismatch between environmental planning and the climate change planning which is happening and the urban and the planning otherwise so that is something that we need to bridge it and more and more people raising questions is one of the ways in which we can answer it there is now what you. there are a lot of questions poured in but yes you can navigate the story Kajal, would you like to um unmute and ask your question uh yes yes just a second um yeah uh yeah i'm audible Yes, go ahead to Kajal. Uh, yes, sir. So I have I mean few questions. Not like, like so. First of all, so thank you for your uh, you know interactive session because you get to know a lot of things uh, along with your presentation and it was quite interactive. Uh, so, sir, my question is like, what do you think? What do you I mean most promising technologies uh, that that uh, for mitigate climate change or you can say the adaptability of climate change? Uh, one thing. Uh, the second thing is that like uh, 
there is a lot of things that we can assure we can uh, assure that like uh, uh, carbon credits or you know uh, global carbon emission so so the what policies can be implemented to, to reduce the emission uh, emission of uh, greenhouse gases apart from the uh, carbon credit uh, and third third question uh, of mine is like how can we ensure the global uh, community adequately prepared of no effect of climate change or climate crisis in my opinion okay let me take that last question first i um, you know i'm slightly pessimistic on this part because i do not see that the communities global communities coming together and i have been involved in very strongly in the cop process and i see that the increasingly there has been uh, you know um, countries are actually at loggerheads when it comes to taking certain decisions um, and uh, they take the national interest first than the global interest right here and climate change falls in the other line and that's where most of the negotiation fails so that's the major problem and slowly uh, it may improve but at this moment we are not cooperating in fact the way the ipcc report is telling us that we are going to breach 2 degrees um, you know mark only because we have not Absolutely. cooperated so far right so that's the thing yeah, yeah. so in your future don't see much of cooperation unless there's a drastic change in which uh, things i always say that you know when the flood happens in in germany flood happens in france heat wave happens and people in europe that is where the time when these people wake up and they'll say that, okay what is happening in the south asia Absolutely. or uh, you know africa is when it is of concern and that's the whole problem i think the, that's one number one uh, coming to the policies there are many empty number of policies to in, reduce the you know emissions um uh, very simple is going uh, you know um, for example the um EVs are there, right? So electric vehicles, which is there now, I think it's it's uh, there are a lot of uh, what we would say uh, has been uh, effort by the government in India, especially I, I must love that slowly things are getting much better. Uh, the entire uh, you know our uh, 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 entire portfolio of uh, electricity uh, is also small portion started to come from alternative sources like solar and wind and other things. That's also slowly changing. I think we are on a right track uh, on this part. EV is is going to transfer form the systems and that's where i'm looking forward and then a lot of companies also coming the private sector is also participating to keep the answer very short because i know this is only one minute left so i'll give it to the vishna anything else because there are a lot of questions pouring in uh, i over to you the vishna um if you have time dr prakash can we i have no i can extend by 10 minutes maximum okay okay sure sure um debjani would you like to ask your question Um, maybe I'll just read it out. Dr. Yeah, read out. Yeah. In spite of USA having the higher per capita emission, human vulnerability is low. Is it because of their mitigation? No. So it's not mitigation. It's just that the government has, uh, you know, I mean, one is that the population on their side, there are only 400 plus million people. Uh, so uh, second part is that their per capita income is very, very high, right? So uh, when your income levels are high, you are able to co-op with the systems much better than other uh, people who have no other means to survive. And that's why uh, in the USA, the uh, vulnerability, human vulnerability is much lesser uh, as com compared to other, uh, uh, you know, uh, above other parts of the world. And especially in South America, South America, uh, in, in South Asia, Asia, for example, or in uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the human vulnerability index is very, very high because they just don't have, and so also there's a colonial past in most of the places, right? And that means that uh, it, is, it is taking, it's only 50, 60 years that some of these countries have been, uh, you know, has seen freedom. And then they're, even then, uh, you know, some of the African countries, they're still dependent on the Northern countries for the resources. So there's a lot of other geopolitics as well as political economy, which is, which is there, which is part of this one. Yeah, not a very easy answer though, uh, but yeah, we can take forward the conversation later sometime. Uh, Benny, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. You know, uh, Prakash just wanted to have one understanding, basically. Uh, I work directly with farmers and try to work on you know, uh, sustainability. Uh, very focusedly, we work on that part. Uh, do you think uh, carbon trading can help uh, to mitigate this bigger challenge uh, uh what's your take on that 
Yeah. Many very interesting question. And I am sorry, I will not have a very straight cut answer to this one because the devil lies in the detail. All right. Uh, on the concept, I'm totally sold out that the carbon credit will be able to work because for example, within India also, if you want to trade carbon, right, in company, which is, and now with the ESG I was talking about, so there's an ESG a framework which tells you, okay, fine, you are emitting this much of carbon. Now you have to buy carbon credit so that you can uh, minimize, you can make it net zero, right? So, and that means I'll go to Benny and I said, okay, fine, Benny, give me 10 farmers who um, can, uh, you know, uh, make that area or 20 farmers or something. I can transfer the money or to a village development committee, in, you know, in your vicinity and I'll transfer that money and I will let them uh, protect a water body or protect a forest body and all that. So on principle, this is definitely a very good idea. Uh, there are a lot of people who have started to work on this one, but still we don't have much success at this moment because of the policies also and then uh, their complexity in which carbon credit could also be, um, uh, you know, both, uh, you know, how do you measure carbon credits? How do you attribute and contribute to the this process? There are some nuances that this has to be done, but on the principle part, of it i'm totally uh, for it benny but uh, definitely we need to work on the details in fact uh, we'll be happy if you take some initiative when we work together on this one definitely sir yeah i think i'll get in touch yeah uh, yes sir i think there are a lot of you know methodologies come across for carbon credit one is yes. vera second is gold standard so you can refer that thing what is the ccb model also work for that whether it's a climate community and biodiversity. So you're talking about, uh, you know, agriculture. So there is obviously the Vera model or maybe the gold model is suitable for you. That's my yeah, opinion. Yeah, yeah, maybe some other day we can do the discussion, Devish. Now we can have some more <laughs> discussion on carbon credit only. Absolutely, yeah. sir. Absolutely. That is <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sure. Thank you, Benny. Uh, Mushtaba has asked a question. Afghanistan has no role on climate change, but it is the most vulnerable country in the world. Um, there are eight out of 10 in vulnerable countries of the world. What should they do to mitigate the effect of climate change? So Afghanistan doesn't have to mitigate. I mean, evidently, you know, mitigation is a uh, is important part of it. But at, at this moment, I think Afghanistan qualifies for loss and damage fund because um, they have not been contributing to the climate change person problem, but they have been receiving in. And that is one thing. Also, the you know the uh, history of Afghanistan is so uh, difficult and so complex. Uh, uh, and that has uh, led to, because certain systems in Afghanistan, especially the irrigation systems, were a beautiful system. Imagine... 1,000 and 1,500 years before, they have channeled water from the irrigation, from the glacier systems and irrigated their fields benignly without going with the flow of water, such a serene environment that they're living in and still living in these areas. So I would say that, um, you know, uh, uh, this is... Uh, a difficult thing how what is that again because they're ultimately their carbon uh, emission is much much lower to a level but they are at the receiving end of, of the thing so mitigation has to done by other people who are emitting and polluting the environment not much uh, on afghanistan side afghanistan has to protect its people from the vagaries of climate change impact and that's where you have to work on the human development that means investment in health infrastructure in infrastructure investment in education for girls and uh, men and boys uh, has to be there. So though basic infrastructure and basic, uh, you know, uh, amenities have to be given to people. And that's where we, Afghanistan has to work, uh, not much on. And then that is, uh, you know, the way uh, it is also creating havoc. Some of the uh, floods which is happening in Afghanistan is unprecedented nature. And that means you also have to protect your people from these uh, things, uh, increasing, uh, you know, flood information systems, getting it to the last person in the village, all that is part and huge work is required on this front. Uh, and I'm sorry, Mojaba, that uh, there's a there's a long way to go for Afghanistan to cope with the climate change. And I hope uh, some of you like uh, people like you take forward and I'll be very happy to come together uh, any way possible. Thank you so much. There's two more questions, uh, Dr. Prakash. So Amir has asked, how do you see the intersection of climate change with agriculture? And what are the ways agriculture industry could create negative climate feedback? That's a very good, big question. I'm not sure if I'm qualified even to answer this, but let me just try and attempt it. 
See, I mean, as I said earlier, agriculture is the first sector. Water and agriculture, these are two sectors which is totally affected by climate change. And uh, the way things are happening, agriculture is already last 20, 25 years itself. Agriculture is going on a, you know, there's no growth in agriculture, right? So though it's, it's on a decline. Uh, and on the top, you have climate change process. So that is something that we really have to see what are the ways in which we can protect the interests of the farmers because it will also impact with the food security part of it. And especially those areas which has... Uh, farmers who are much more vulnerable uh, and so that mapping part of them there's a lot of process which has already been there uh, which we need to lead but in a very short uh, time I think this is uh, time. This is something that we can take forward the communication uh, uh, you know further uh, and discussion further to see what are the things that can be done but uh, I, I first I think that there has to be a, 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 a farmer's protection system. We already have a lot of these things happening with the state government and all that sporadic, but we need to also work at a much more coordinated fashion on this one. But farmers are the most affected that I can sell you. Uh, nobody is interested. If you talk to any farmers, uh, and, and these are not the farmers who are you know, high profile farmers, the normal farmers that you see, they will never be able to tell you that they want to their children to be in, in, in the same business like, like like, like them so that's what whole part of it that it is a very very difficult situation for them and i really see that there's not much of a remorse for us over to you Devishnu. the last question from aruna uh, could you elaborate on how land uh, forest plays an important role in carbon sequestration and the challenges in studying this process for research yeah, so uh, very good question. So see, uh, so both, uh, you know, first, let's just, just take the forest. The forest is, is the one which actually sinks in the carbon, right? Uh, water body sinks in the carbon. In the land also, when you have the certain agroforest system, they also are, are act as a carbon sink. So these are the places, the more and more forests that you have, more and more better land use fashion you have, you are able to create more carbon sink. And that means your mitigation efforts will be much better, right? So that is where we are there. And there's a link which is also there and it's a huge area for research and I'm very happy to work offline with you um, and help you further because the time is very short so I'm not going to go deeper into it but I always get connected my email ID is with the Vishnu you can always get connected with me over to you the Vishnu Thank you very much, Dr. Prakash. With that, we'll uh, round up this masterclass. Uh, thank you again for candidly asking everyone's question and making time for this. Uh, for everyone who joined, I hope it was a valuable session for you all. And please look out for our future masterclasses on um, uh, LinkedIn and social media pages.